In late 2020, physicists in China generated controversy by claiming quantum advantage with a photonic system that's technically not programmable. Other companies have been experimenting with photonic systems, including Quix Quantum. How do these machines work? Should scientists redefine what quantum advantage means? Join us for a light exploration of light-based quantum computing in this episode of The Post-Quantum World. I'm your host, Konstantinos Kragianis. I lead quantum computing services at Prativity, where we're helping companies prepare for the benefits and threats of this exploding field. I hope you'll join each episode as we explore the technology and business impacts of this post-quantum era. Our guest today is the CTO of Quix Quantum, uh, Dr. Yelmer Renema. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and, and it's fun. Uh, right now I'm in uh, San Diego at the IQT conference while I'm recording this. And uh, it's, it's pretty wild. I'm reaching to you all the way in the Netherlands, right? <laughs> yes, yes. I'm, I'm coming to you today from uh, actually my home office in the Netherlands. Excellent. And uh, tell us a little bit about your background in uh, quantum photonics. Uh, you mean my personal background or yeah, that of the company? Yeah, your personal. Yep. yep. Okay, so I did a PhD in Leiden uh, in the group of Martin van Exter and Dirk Baumeister on uh, superconducting single photon detectors. I then did a postdoc in Oxford in the group of Ian Walmsley, then moved back to the Netherlands on a fellowship and uh, started there initially as an academic and then founded uh, Quix Quantum in 2019 together with Hans van der Vleckert. Yeah, so it seemed like your background helped direct the, the direction of the company, <laughs> basically. Yes, yes, yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, with that focus on photonics. Um, so Quix Quantum is relatively young. It's a startup, right? So I guess it's like three years old now. Um, so tell us a little bit about the company and, and why you started it. So Quix Quantum was founded... Uh, based on a piece of scientific serendipity. So what happened was more or less the following. Uh, when I was in Oxford as a postdoc, we were looking for devices to do these kind of quantum optical experiments with. And it just so happened that one of our hires in the group was someone from the University of Twente in the Netherlands who said, hey, I know how to get our hands on these devices because there is a group there that is really good at integrated optics and that is working with these things. So we organized that we could actually borrow one of these devices from the University of Twente, take it to Oxford and measure it. And when we did that, we realized that we really had something, you know, that was, we really had something, let's say. So we, when I came back to the Netherlands about a year later, I, you know, found the people who had actually fabricated this device and I said, okay, we really have to start exploiting this technology of silicon nitride uh, optical waveguides. We have to start exploiting this for quantum technologies. And so after some discussions, which took about another half year, we ended up founding uh, Quix Quantum in January 2019. Uh, the company, you know, as this goes, was initially very small, uh, started with a handful of people in the summer of 2020. Uh, so about a year later, we secured um, a we secured a seed round with uh, a few investors. Actually, the last hand that I shook before the pandemic was of the person who would ended up becoming the lead investor. So that was kind of an interesting way to go into lockdown. Um, <laughs> yeah. And yeah, literally, the literally we were having you know some like the last in-person meeting that I had was, was, you know, this kind of meeting. So that was kind of an interesting way to go into the, to go into the pandemic. But uh, anyway, so we, had the, we had that over the summer, um, over the summer of 2020, we had that, uh, that seed round and we, um, uh, you know, then grew. Uh, so we're now at, uh, at about a dozen people. Uh, and then, we also have recently realized uh, hardware sales, right? So we're actually something that I'm very proud of is that Quix Quantum as a, you know, a lot of what quantum computing is, of course, about is about selling a promise of the future, but something that Quix is actually doing 
where I would say it's ahead of the pack is that it's actually already generating hardware sales, right? So we've sold about half a dozen devices, half a dozen of these quantum photonic processors to both academics and to other quantum startups worldwide. Um, and this is also, you know, why I say we are the market leader in photonic quantum computing hardware, because there are not very many companies that can say that they have sold, you know, half a dozen quantum processor units. Okay, and your first processor came out really quickly, right? Uh, it came out like within a year of the company founding. Um, and it, I, I've heard it called record breaking. Uh, can you elaborate like, on what, um, what, what like led to that, you know, uh, moniker for that first processor? Well, so first, uh, I want to say something about why we were able to move so fast. So mm -hmm. we at Quicks are organized as a fabulous company. So we try to outsource as much of the fabrication as we can. And what we actually did was we took, um, you know, we took on board the fabrication capabilities of the company that had originally uh, designed this processor that went to Oxford. So the one that was done as an academic collaboration, and we simply iterated further on that technology. And so a okay. lot of what we needed to do to be successful was already there, particularly in the kind of low level components that we needed. So a lot of the, let's say, groundwork that you need in order to make a good quantum photonic processor is to have low, lo low optical loss, optical waveguides, right? So our information carriers in our system are photons. And these photons, you know, they want to move at the speed of light. So you need to provide some channels for them to move over. And these channels are what are called waveguides. And the thing that you don't want to happen is that these photons um, are lost to your computation as they move over these waveguides. And so the thing that actually made us realize that, you know, someone should really get started on building quantum photonic processors out of silicon nitride is when we computed the component density that you can achieve in silicon nitride quantum photonic processors. So it turns out that it's not so much about the optical losses per centimeter that you can specify. So if you talk to a, an integrated optics person, they will say, oh, you know, I can make waveguides and they have losses of, you know, so and so many decibels per centimeter. It actually turns out that that's not the important number. The important number is losses per component. So one of the reasons why silicon nitride is really good is because it sits at a sweet spot where you can both build relatively compact components, but still have relatively low loss. And so there are other materials out there that have smaller components, but then the losses are so much higher that it still doesn't work out. And there's other materials that have lower losses, but then the components are huge. So it still doesn't work out. And so silicon nitride is precisely at that sweet spot. And that's what we realized in 2018. And that's why we said, okay, you know, we really have to do something with this. So that's a little bit so, about like why we were able to go fast. Um, yeah, it, and, and now, it was that and now initial about, machine, right? That, that, that one that you borrowed, you essentially improved upon. <laughs> well, I mean, that's maybe not I, okay, I think if you say it like that, that's maybe not doing enough credit to our engineers because by now there is a lot more cleverness in this device than there was, uh, you know, in the in the original uh, academic one. Um, mm -hmm. But but what's maybe also worth saying is the metrics for these kinds of devices are the number of optical channels that you have and then the end-to-end -end losses. So those are more or less the two, the two things that you care about. And what we were able to achieve, because we had this very good underlying technology, we were able to achieve what was at the time the largest processor in the world with 12 channels. Um, and we also call these channels Q modes. That's something that we can go into later. Um, mm -hmm. And then with also the lowest losses in the world, right? So eventually the, um, and then we put that out there in a, uh, in a webinar. 
So if you go onto our YouTube channel, you can look up the webinar from 2020, where we present this 12 mode processor. And then actually earlier this year, we improved on that further and we put out a 20 mode processor. Uh, and that processor has about 2.9 dB of optical loss. So that's about 50% of optical transmission if you don't speak photonics engineer. And um, uh, and so it has 20 channels. And this is, uh, as I said, this is the largest number of uh, channels reported in the scientific literature. So this is something that yes. we're very proud of. That's exactly what I was going to ask you about next, the newest one having 20 Q modes. Um, did you want to just take a step back and explain to listeners uh, the difference between Q modes and Q bits? Yeah. So a, so a Q mode is essentially... For, so, so it's essentially for linear optics, uh, the analogum of a qubit, right? And so linear optics is a restricted model of quantum computation where you do not have access to all of the uh, operations that you have access to in a, in a gate-based model. Um, but where, of course, you know, you have the big advantage that linear optics is a, is a relatively straightforward thing uh, to implement uh, in an experiment. So if you are aware of the recent quantum advantage demonstrations that have happened in uh, at the USTC in Shanghai, in China, then mm -hmm. this is also linear optics, right? So it's those kinds of models that, uh, it's that kind of model of computation that this quick quantum photonic processor uh, ultimately slots into. And the biggest criticism of that uh, that Chinese um, experiment was that it wasn't solving a real problem, um, which I guess is a theme that comes up in advantage uh, quantum advantage uh, experimentation. Um, what types of uh, problems are, can you apply your processor to? Well, I mean, let me say something first about the point of quantum advantage experiments not solving a real problem, um, because I feel that there, there has been a little bit of moving of the goalposts by some people in the community. So, mm -hmm. you know, after this, and this, this is not something that's even specific to optics, right? So after this, uh, after the 2019 Google quantum advantage paper came out, there was similar criticism where people said, yeah, yeah. But this doesn't actually do anything useful. And I think the counter the counter criticism to that is very simple. It's just to say, well, no one ever claimed that it did, right? And so it's um, it's in that sense, you know, I I I don't agree with the people who have redefined the word quantum advantage to mean uh, useful quantum computation because this is simply, you know, quantum advantage has a very clear cut you know, computational complexity definition. And I don't see why we should be, why we should be modeling with that, let's say. Of course, mm -hmm. obviously, you know, once you have achieved this, the next question is, okay, what is it good for, right? And so it turns out, um, you know, the question of, so I'm a hardware guy, right? Like I ultimately make quantum photonic hardware. And so I would say that the question of, what you can do with uh, linear, opti linear optics has not nearly received the amount of attention from theorists and from computer scientists that it should have received, but there are good ideas out there. So it, for example, turns out that um, these kind of linear optical systems map onto the structure of graphs. So there are certain problems of finding, I mean, it, it goes maybe a little bit too far to discuss exactly how this works, but there are certain problems within graphs where you can find, uh, where you're looking for certain structures in these graphs, or you're looking to identify whether a graph has a particular hidden structure where uh, you could do this with such a device and you could not do it with a, a classical device. And this maybe sounds a little bit abstract, but if you consider that you can 
represent almost any, uh, you know, any relationship between things you can represent as a graph, right? And so whether that's, you know, social networks or COVID transmission or, uh, you know, uh, even 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 things like uh, uh, for protein folding, you even care about graph structures. Uh, so there are lots of these, you know, there are lots of problems there. And then other things um, that that we are looking into are, uh, you know, that or at least that that one can consider are machine learning applications, uh, cryptographic applications, and there's a whole bunch of these kind of things. But actually, one of the reasons why we decided to uh, start selling devices early on is for a very simple reason, which is that we wanted to unleash the creativity of the community onto these, you know, onto this as a problem. And another thing that I should say here is that we as Quicks are not restricting ourselves to these devices, right? So this is kind of historically what we have been doing, and it's something that we are uh, very good at, right? So we are you know, building the best quantum photonic processors out there. We are also looking, we are also, you know, building up uh, towards universal quantum computation using photonics, which is also a thing that is possible. So you can map linear optics to, uh, to a, like the, fam the familiar gate-based uh, model of quantum computation and the, essentially, the price that you pay for this is uh, is overhead, right? So, what is really nice about these kind of low level um, about these experiments that, for example, uh, have happened at USDC, is that every single photon is kind of a computational unit, if you want, in the system, right? So, every photon is directly, you know, adding to the complexity of the problem. And so that, that also makes it very implementable because you don't, you know, you need quote unquote only only a hundred photons in order to get to a quantum advantage, which is, you know, okay. turns out to be, you know, if you work hard enough on that problem, that actually turns out to be a solvable problem. Yeah, I mean, you're not that far off, right? <laughs> no, exactly um, right. Um, yeah, you're and at so, 20s. Yes, so we are, okay, this is maybe another thing to say is that what we care about particularly as Quicks is we care about the programmability of this optical transformation, right? So um, if I compare, uh, right? So, so the larger systems that are out there, they have a static or a more or less static optical transformation. And so in that case, um, or, you know, the opportunity to vary some phases, but not the opportunity to directly tune the complete, not the opportunity to completely control the transmission matrix of your optical system, which is ultimately what, what let's say, encodes the computation that you're doing. Um, so, yeah, I was going to ask you then, with this kind of machine, um, and, and you sell it in multiple forms, right? You can get sort of like the core processor and then a complete setup with everything you would need to get it running, light sources, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, how, would, uh, how would people interact with this at the current stage it's in? So, so you have, I guess, six customers already. Um, how, do they, how do they then interact? Is there some kind of like um, stack that still has to be created for them to manipulate, like to program, et cetera? Um, what, what, what does that look like? Like actually so, interacting? So I would say that the stack is quite mature. So for the, so we don't just sell the processor as a chip, but we sell it as a very high TRL device. So the processor comes packaged in a control box that has all the electronics in it, uh, temperature control and so on, and also comes with a computer program that knows about all of the calibrations on chip and so you as a user, right, you provide the photon sources. And if we're just talking about the processor, you provide the photon sources and the detectors. Um, and it's literally, it's a computer that has a program running on it where you type in 
the optical transformation that you want to do, you press enter and the system does it for you. So it knows about all the calibrations. It knows about how to interact mm -hmm. with all of the various subcomponents on the chip. It, it does all of that for you. So in that sense, it's a very, okay. it's a very plug and play system. Okay. And then are you able to like, so a lot of listeners are probably used to the concept of, you know, either annealing or gates, one or the other, you know, gate based or annealing. So, so what does it look like to, to program this? Like what kind, how can these transformations be mapped to some kind of problem? Does it, does it have like any kind of set um, language or, or gate system that it applies already? No, so like we're, primitive one? we're not, we're not yet at the level where we have this system in the cloud with some kind of interface mm -hmm. uh, where you can talk to it directly remotely. This, you know, if we had something like that, that would of course uh, make these, you know, then, then you can immediately point to it and say, okay, this is the thing, this is how it works. But this is something that we are very much working on. So the goal is to have this in the cloud with all the peripherals in 2023, so next year. And then okay. there will be a there will be a system where essentially you can say, you know, you know, just just to make kind of a rough sketch uh, of of you know what such a system would uh, would look like. You can imagine that you, in a certain, you know, you can provide something about the input state. So let's say you can say where there will be photons and where not. You can say. What the optical transformation looks like and then you simply get a certain number of shots of the experiment right so you mm -hmm. press the button and our hardware starts running records the outputs uh, of this system puts them in a text file and sends them to you right so that that's what that would then look like okay yeah similar i guess to, to other approaches so next year we could imagine then another, this will be another photonic option available on the cloud. Um, so customers who buy it now, do they then, um, do they run some special program to talk to that other program that understands the calibrations and things like that? Is there like a, a local programming interface they use uh, for the lab? Well, I mean, ultimately, um... You'd have to ask our customers, I would say. But oh, okay. as far as oh, so no, developing I mean, that, that. no, no, no. But I mean, as as far as far as they have told us, right? Because of course, you know, if someone buys a device from us and they are not happy telling us what they're going to do with it, that's also fine with us, ultimately, right? Um, huh. But interesting. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a commercial business, right? So you know, mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's a and it's a finished product, right? So we trust we trust our product well enough to send it out there and just have people work with it. Um, but anyway, what, what I was going to say was, of course, we do have customers who do provide feedback. I mean, of course we do. Um, but a lot of the customers that we have so far are people who are domain experts in quantum photonics, right? So they have some ideas about what they want to do with this thing and they um, understand what is going on well enough to talk indeed via some other program, right? So we have some some API where you know you can have your software running and it talks to our software and you can integrate our processor into the workflow of your system, you know, much as you would any piece of any piece of laboratory electronics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that so that's, that's the dream. That's and that's the dream with the cloud too. The just integrating it in like, like you would select another GPU or whatever. Now you want to select another QPU to do something extra. Yes. Um, yeah, exactly. That's ultimately yeah. the dream of the cloud. That's absolutely true. And, and you hinted at, at some areas where this would already excel. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you um, about if this machine is going to be one day the best at something if you could predict like for example um you know we know an annealer is always going to be probably the best at optimization um and then gate based would be different use cases so would you say there's a chance for like no matter what happens in the future that this type of machine will just be the best at something yeah i mean definitely right um but i want to say in general that the uh 
you know, the question of where NISC quantum computing is going is obviously something that a lot of people uh, are busy with. And so, you know, we are building these devices, but we are not just building these devices for the sake of building these devices. They are also a stepping stone towards universal quantum computation, and they are a demonstration of the strength of the underlying technology. Right? So there's kind of various ways that you can look at this. Okay. So you imagine the ability to continue scaling and adding Q modes to one day have enough to be, you know, like a universal gate-based computer like this approach, or do you imagine like changing the approach? Yeah, that's, that's not quite how it works. So if you want to, um, if you want to go to universal quantum computation, you have to add uh, additional capabilities. So it's not just enough to have passive linear interference uh, on, on a chip. And I mean, and this is something where we are, you know, evaluating uh, components, right? So we're looking at, uh, at the moment, and this is obviously, this is uh, something that I cannot say very much more about than this, but sure. this is kind of where we are exploring the space. Yeah, I was just trying to, that's what I was asking about, because I was trying to get a sense of um, what kind of plans for roadmap, like, are you thinking along lines of making some kind of modifications? Um, uh, so just, just to think, like, if, if I were to ask you, like, three years from now, what would you expect to see? Would you expect to see something more along the lines of, like, um, universal gate-based um, existing? Yeah, so, the, yeah. so the roadmap is to have the current non-universal system in the cloud by 2023, and then to have mm -hmm. a, universal, uh, a universal system that maps onto gate-based by 2026. Okay. That's more yeah, or less that's what, what I was going to get at. Like. Yeah. yeah. That's what the roadmap looks like. And then in this, at the same time, keep building these non-universal systems and, you know, make them bigger, right? So by the end of this calendar year, we want to have out there a 50 Q mode system. And then let's say push that towards an actual demonstration of a quantum advantage using our own hardware. That's sort of the plan okay. in that direction. And for that quantum advantage, would it be um, in the sense you described before, like just it just proves that it's better at something or would it yeah. be to, to, so it wouldn't be trying to worry about the critics and, and the whole like, is this a usable application or something? Well, I mean, it has to go. I mean, of course it has to go to a universe. Of course it has to go to a u useful application, right? But Mm -hmm. One also has to one also has to understand that these things go step by step, right? So, mm -hmm. like right now, you know, we are sitting on some of the most advanced photonic hardware in the world, right? And we want to build that out into, you know, into useful applications. And having a quantum advantage in the sort of, you know, complexity sense of the world word is a stepping stone towards that, right? And so while we are doing these things in the lab, we are at the same time talking to, uh, to our partners on the software side to try to you know, build out the, the, the software stack on that side, right? So we're not sitting still there either. Okay. And do you anticipate, um, so, so where you're located right now, it, it's a region of the Netherlands, it's like considered a photonics ecosystem, right? Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot around you in, in that space. So are you, um, are you constantly then uh, looking to recruit in that area and, and bring in, you know, fresh ideas? Um, just, just was wondering how that, that impacts the day to day, like being surrounded by all that. <laughs> well, I would say that, in fact, being in this kind of hotspot of photonic technology development is really crucial for us. So something that we have going at the moment, for example, is a project, uh, is an applied research project together with uh, another company called Fix, which makes essentially packaging for photonics, right? So they are very good at the questions of, okay, how do you get light on and off chip? How do you get electronic signals on and off chip? And as these systems get larger and larger, this is a question that becomes absolutely vital because at some point it's not so much a question anymore of 
can you actually get the processing done on chip? But it becomes a question of, can you actually get the chip to talk to the outside world? And it actually turns out that that is maybe even the harder question at some point. And, and this is, of course, a theme that you see in many kind of quantum computing um, technology platforms, right? If you talk to the superconducting guys, then at some point they also say, well, you know, one of our big problems is actually getting so and so many cables down into a fridge, right? So this is, mm -hmm. not, this is not something that is even unique to photonics. Um, but what is great for us is that these, these people from FIX are just located one building away, right? And then the university with which we collaborate, uh, you know, and who are also, right? So for example, the photon source that we use to do the calibration of uh, this 12 mode processor and this 20 mode processor, that photon source is located at the university, right? Which is another five minutes walk away. So I would say that actually this ecosystem approach has been absolutely crucial to the success of the company. And it's also been crucial to the fact that we have been able to move so fast, right? So we essentially function as an integrator within this ecosystem for all of these excellent pieces of technology um, that are out there. And we put them all together with it, adding our own expertise on quantum. Mm -hmm. so, so it sounds like... Uh... For all you know, some problem you're trying to solve, someone might solve right down the block uh, without even knowing you were worried about it. <laughs> it precisely, could be right precisely. There. Yeah, precisely that's, that's right. Yeah, that's pretty and, terrific. And, and, and it's also a cost issue, right? So if you consider that, you know, none of this machinery is cheap. And so it makes no sense. And we are, a, you know, as anyone in quantum is, we are what someone who comes from the semiconductor industry would consider a very, very low production volume operation, right? Like we, we need, we make, you know, let's say a couple of dozen chips a year, sort of that order of magnitude, right? And so it makes no sense to buy a multi-million euro machine to attach fibers to these chips and then use it 25 times a year. Right, so it's great if there is someone down the hall who has that machine and who has it running all the time, and who you can just you know commercially get your, you know, couple of dozen of chips a year, uh, get fibers attached to them, right? And so that that's kind of why this ecosystem works so well. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and and you know how things like this go. Um, some synergies will create some wonderful surprise one day, and and you know the next great revolution begins, you know? Precisely. Um, precisely. Just, yeah. But just, you know, like hotbeds of thinking, uh, like going back to something like the Solvay Conference of Physics, you know, you just never know. You get minds together and, and magic happens. Um, yeah. So, Yalmer, thank you so much for joining me. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, look forward to seeing uh, how that roadmap progresses. Brilliant. Thank you. Now it's time for Coherence, the Quantum Executive Summary where I take a moment to highlight some of the business impacts we discussed today in case things got too nerdy at times. Let's recap. Quix Quantum is a three-year-old startup focused on photonic quantum computing, and they've already sold half a dozen processors to academics and companies. A fabulous company, Quix outsources the fabrication to a company that already laid groundwork in silicon nitride waveguide technology for similar machines in academia. These optical channels are known as Q-modes. Quix has 20 Q-modes in its latest machine. Q-modes and linear optics are analogous to qubits. The linear optics approach is similar to that used in the Chinese machine Jiuzhang that caused some controversy with its claims of quantum advantage. Should quantum advantage only be declared if a usable problem is solved quicker by a quantum computer than a classical one? Dr. Renema feels that this is a moving of the goalposts, so to speak. No one claimed a useful problem was being solved, only that quantum advantage at a task was being demonstrated. Linear optics do not use gates, but can perform useful tasks. They map onto the structures of graphs well, so use cases could include finding hidden structures in graphs, solving problems in social network data, and research in folding proteins. Even machine learning and cryptographic use cases are possible. 
Quix is hoping that the devices they provide will spur creativity. Their customers are domain experts after all. Quix believes that one day linear optics will be used in gate-based quantum computing too, and are working on a universal gate-based system with added components for release in 2026. Programming the current machines is enabled by a mature software stack loaded into a control box. The software interacts with all the subcomponents on the processor and performs the necessary calibrations to enable computation. There's no cloud stack layer yet for programming, but they're working on an interface like that for 2023. Before that, by the end of 2022, they're hoping to have a 50 Q mode system that may demonstrate quantum advantage. That does it for this episode. Thanks to Dr. Yelmer Renema for joining to discuss Quix Quantum and their photonic quantum computer. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe to Protivity's The Post Quantum World and maybe leave a review to help others find us. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Constant Hacker. That's Constant with a K, Hacker. You'll find links there to what we're doing in quantum computing services at Protivity. You can also DM me questions or suggestions for what you'd like to hear on the show, or maybe share your thoughts on Quantum Advantage. For more information on our quantum services, check out Protivity.com or follow Protivity Tech on Twitter and LinkedIn. Until next time, be kind and stay quantum curious.